I'm joined now by Saudi Arabia's finance minister, Mohammed Al Jadan. His Excellency, great to have you here in Davos. Um, although the weather keeps going from freezing cold to sunny to freezing cold again. Um, bit of a different feel from the winter time. I want to ask you to walk us through how these oil prices, over $100 a barrel for a sustained amount of time, are impacting your bottom line because higher oil prices, technically good for Saudi Arabia. Um, I think the whole Vision 2030 came about because we wanted to decouple what we do, uh, our fiscal policy, from the volatility of the oil price. And I don't think um, talking about specific price would help, but generally, I th we are going to make sure that the windfall that is coming from the current oil price levels is used in a better way than what we used to do uh, 10 years ago. Uh, there are very specific plans in terms of the fiscal you know, discipline that we um, have introduced following Vision 2030, and you know, part of it will go to buffers to make sure that we are able to absorb and deal with any external shocks in the future. But the others will then go to national development uh, fund that will help private sector investments. Uh, the rest will go to PIF. Yeah. What do you think about what happens next with regards to those investments? One of the things that we've been talking a lot about over the last several days is the idea that whether you're an international oil company or a petrodollar economy, essentially, um, you're going to be able to use a lot of this windfall, as you say, for reinvestment in the energy sector, which is something that the world now understands they desperately need. How much of that cash do you anticipate will go right back in um, to your oil and gas sector? Well, significant part of it. I can tell you that we are doubling down on both on our commitment to, to uh, climate change and, and renewables, um, displacing all liquids, and that would require significant amount of investments to retire uh, old assets and then bring in more efficient assets, um, uh, develop new solar and wind um, uh, plants. The other side is actually investing in more capacity uh, uh, in oil because we wanted to make sure that the world has enough capacity with the lack of investment elsewhere. I mean, yeah. that there is a problem with investment in, in fossil fuel. And while transition needs to happen and we ultimately need to transition to um, clean and cleaner uh, energy, it is not going to happen in one year or in 10 years. So we need fossil fuel for an, an extended period of time. What would you say to those who would criticize the kingdom and say that Saudi Arabia is milking this situation just to add more to the coffers? And I'm talking about um, keeping Russia as part of the OPEC Plus agreement. I'm talking about the fact that Saudi Arabia and other Gulf countries as well have continued that relationship and even investments in the Russia um, post-invasion of Ukraine. What I could tell you is, I mean, in terms of what is happening um, uh, in, in Ukraine, it is a very, very sad situation. Um, uh, the humanitarian um, suffering uh, is really sad and, and we feel sorry for it. We made our position in relation to um, uh, the Ukraine very clear in the United Nations. We voted with the resolution. We voted with uh, protecting and, and respecting uh, sovereign borders. So that is our position. We respect international law and we expect everybody to do so. But at the same time, we call for everybody to find a peaceful way of resolving this um, issue. Uh, we had a very successful relationship with Ukraine for years now. And actually our investment, our trade with Ukraine is growing a lot faster than if, even if you compare it with Russia. Uh, so that perception is actually not accurate. Um, that said, when we talked about, you know, talk about OPEC and OPEC Plus, I think the, the Minister of uh, Energy uh, made the position very clear. Uh, we are here to make sure that we stabilize the market, we uh, reduce volatility. I mean, if you compare volatility of the oil with other commodities, including gas, including coal, yeah. you will see that actually OPEC and OPEC Plus played a major role in reducing that volatility. Yeah. When you think about what happens next as a, a knock-on effect, if you will, of President Putin's invasion of Ukraine, one of the things that's deeply concerning for folks that I speak here uh, to in Davos is, is the food crisis. And we're seeing that playing out already across the Middle East. Saudi Arabia has already contributed to billions to Egypt in order to help that country um, 
what would you say, survive this current trend um, of, of food shortages. How much more do you anticipate the kingdom is going to have to spend to keep other Middle East governments afloat at this point? I think this is, this is a very serious issue. Food crisis is real. I think it is still underestimated by the world community. Uh, it is going to cause a lot of issues, not only in, in, in the MENA region, but even in the wider globe. The MENA region is very, very, very vulnerable. It imports a lot of food. Um, uh, it represents only 6% of the population of the world, but actually or almost in certain countries, they import 90% of their needs. Uh, so we need to be very careful on what is happening in the region. We will provide the support needed as much as we can, but it is not only us. It is, this is a global problem that we need to work collaboratively with the world to you know, bring about solutions. And, and you know, we led the G20 and the world, actually, through the COVID, through collaboration and discussion and, and coming together to, to bring about solutions. And I think the food crisis calls for such co collaboration. When you see what's happening with regards to the situation in Europe today, the European, uh, the EU Commission President Ursula von der Leyen suggesting earlier today on CNBC with my colleagues that a solution to helping Ukraine could potentially be um, the seizure of Russian assets and that they could begin to pay for the damage, frankly, done in Ukraine by Russian forces. As a finance minister, do you believe the West is getting it right when it comes to President Putin's invasion? Are the economic sanctions something that you would advocate? And are you worried about their impact further down the line? Because there are sanctions that we've never seen before. Listen, Saudi Arabia is not a stranger to a situation like this. Um, um, 30 years ago, we had the Iraqi uh, you know, army in our borders. They invaded Kuwait. And we had to step up and support Kuwait and, and the Kuwaiti people. So, and, and we know how it feels. But what I'm worried about is if you don't think through the actions, particularly certain of the sanctions, unintended consequences could be actually very negative for everybody. So we need just to be very careful. And we need to assess how far should we go and what would be the negative impact uh, in other nations. Yeah. Uh, on, on you know, these sanctions. When you think about that and in terms of the broader economy, what's the most concerning aspect of all of this to you? Is it the inflation? We're now talking about stagflation, the possibility of recession. Do you believe that we're going to see the West slipping into recession? I think there is a risk that um, the certain parts of the world will go into recession. Um, uh, the consensus in Davos today is that um, the probabilities of the world going to recession have risen from 15, 20 percent, possibly to 30 plus percent. Um, I will not, you know, it's very difficult really to speculate, but I, I think it is unlikely that we will go into stagflation. Uh, I think the central banks of the world will manage inflation, but it is a real problem and it will be painful to manage it. Uh, some of the uh, consequences is going to be a recession, but hopefully not, you know, long lived. Um, I'm worried about food, and I'm worried about energy crisis. Um, I'm worried about migration. You know, if we are not careful, you will see problems like this rising. And uh, I think there are supply chain issues that people have not thought through. I mean, we talked about even in Europe with energy uh, at this level and most likely politici politicians will have to prioritize households, yes. you will have to shut down industries. Yes. What would be the consequences of shutting down industries? Fertilizers, which then will impact even more food security for next year. Yeah. Uh, Finance Minister, final question. I mean, when you think about this a bit more broadly, obviously Saudi Arabia tied to the U.S. dollar. Um, you said you felt that the Fed is managing this crisis um, effectively, at least for now. Do you believe that when you look at the U.S. economy today, they're on the right track? Because there is a lot of concern, as you say, not just about the inflationary picture, but also about a potential recession. Are we talking about the U.S.? Uh, not necessarily. I think there are a lot of people in the U.S., I can tell you, who are far more experienced and ex experts than me. Um, uh, Janet um, is, is a good friend, and I trust her. I trust her judgment. Um, the Fed is the most experts, and I trust really their judgment. 
uh, I think we will see some recession yeah. in some parts, uh, but I don't think it's going to be for an extended period of time. Your Excellency, thank you so much for joining CNBC. Rosanna, I'm going to toss it back up to you. Thank you so much, Hadley. Fascinating conversation there with the Finance Minister of Saudi Arabia. That is it for us for now. We're going to hand you straight back to our colleagues stateside. Interest rates, I really do. We started the month with the average on the 30-year fix at 4.88% in April, ended it at 5.41%. Remember, these are contracts signed in April. That's what these numbers are based on, not closing. So it's not back several months. This is the most recent indicator. So if you're looking at a $450,000 house, which is what the median price was, that mortgage payment just during the month went up $100. But from the start of the year, when a lot of these folks might have been thinking about buying a new house, that monthly payment has increased by $450. That's a lot for the average borrower out there to make that monthly payment that much higher. Also, looking at the month supply for the builders, a nine-month supply up from a six-month supply in March, that's very high. A five- to six-month supply is generally considered a balance between buyer and seller. So nine months means they're sitting on a lot of properties now. We have Toll Brothers reporting after the bell, and we're going to be looking very closely at cancellation rates on that because we're starting to hear that we are seeing more cancellation rates in the market as people who, again, might have thought about buying in January – put some money down on a new home. Remember, it takes six to eight months to get to that home when you're building. Decided, you know what, can't afford this anymore. So again, that is a big miss, and this is most likely going to hit the builders today. Back to you, David. Yeah, Diana, I'm going to come back to you, actually, because, of course, we've got a market very focused on macroeconomics. You just made that very important point about how much the cost of owning a home has gone up in terms of your mortgage from the beginning of the year. Just put this number in some perspective for our viewers, if you can, given your long history. If you're, you know, is there a period in which you've seen this kind of dramatic fall off that we might look back on? Well, I mean, of course, the Great Recession and the housing crisis, and that was the subprime crisis, that was a much bigger drop, and it was based on all kinds of different fundamentals in the mortgage market, which obviously is not the case today. But you are seeing a consumer who is clearly stretched here. You're seeing inflation. They're having to dole out more money for everything else. A newly built home, maybe it's a discretionary purchase if they can say, look, I'll stay in the home I have or maybe I'm going to continue renting. New homes are more expensive than existing homes. So again, it's that you know higher level buyer. Perhaps they're also more influenced by the stock market. You don't generally see this kind of a month to month drop like this. And we are down um, close to 29% year over year in new home sales. So again, it's a very large drop for the month. And it says that people who were really stretched, they can't take this mortgage rate increase, David. Yeah, Diana, thank you, Diana Olick. Well, we are a little more than 30 minutes into the trading session. Let's give you a look at uh, three movers that we're certainly keeping an eye on. We'll start with Zoom Video. That company topped its earnings estimates and raised its profit outlook. Uh, the stock is down 72% over the last year. As Mike pointed out earlier, it once traded at 25 times revenues, now closer to 25 times earnings. But eking out a bit of a gain so far today. Best Buy, let's take a look there. It was a mixed quarter. Earnings did come in shy forecast. Revenue, though, was actually better than expected by many of the analysts who followed the company. It did trim its full-year outlook based on worsening macroeconomic conditions, but still up 2%. And another retailer we're watching, Abercrombie & Fitch. Those shares are down, uh, almost uh, 29, let's call it 28-plus percent, this after posting what was an unexpected quarterly loss due to Higher costs is what they're saying right now. Carl. All right, David, another big mover to watch, as we said, is Snap on pace for its worst day ever as a public company. CEO Evan Spiegel warned in a note to employees the company will miss its own targets for revenue and earnings this quarter, while also slow hiring for the rest of the year as it deals with inflation, rising rates, and Apple's new privacy features. Joining us this morning, Rosenblatt Security Snap analyst Barton Crockett cut his target from 49 down to 23 today. Barton, it's good to have you back. Thank you. I, I've seen some uh, notes on the street today that Fine. some investors likely feel burned given the guidance from just a few weeks ago. What do you think right. happened? I think that uh, I think we're I think the world is changing. Um, you know, and this is what happens when the macro changes is, um, you know, people are surprised. And, um, you know, I think Snap was kind of a leading indicator of the beginning of some of the weakness in Internet advertising in the first quarter earnings season. Um, and I think they're also, I think, ahead of the curve here in the second quarter and saying that things are getting a little bit weaker. Right. Now, initially, that, that caution that they were feeling 
was largely a, a dynamic out of Ukraine, right? What, what do we think drove this? I mean, I, I've, I've seen some estimates that maybe revenue growth for the last piece of the quarter might have been 15 or, or even less, some estimate. Right. I mean, I, you know, I, I'm modeling that they'll be growing in the teens uh, here in the second quarter when, when the numbers come in. And, uh, you know, I don't think it really improves much from there in the near term. I think that the macro is what they're calling out. At last quarter, they talked about Ukraine. This quarter, the emphasis seems to be on inflation, on interest rates. Um, you know, I think we look and remember the warnings from Walmart, from Target, um, not that those are necessarily the advertisers are driving what's happening here at SNAP, but I think they're emblematic of a toughening environment um, that I think SNAP is beginning to feel. But, you know, as some would beat Wonder Barton, like, wow, macroeconomic headwinds like this translated so quickly into a reduction in advertising. I mean, are you surprised at the rapidity, again, back to Carl's question, kind of of, of what we're seeing here, how quickly perhaps some of these budgets have changed in terms of the willingness of advertisers to spend on the platform? Well, I think everything um, in this day and age is surprising. I mean, we live in a world that's surprising. And I think that what's happened is that um, um, a lot of people are feeling uh, the environment shift really quickly underneath their feet. Um, you know, we're hearing it in the data. You guys talked about the housing market. Um, we've seen it with the retailers. Um, you know, people are kind of, their heads are, uh, people are going through a collective whiplash. And I think SNAP is kind of, um, you know, right at the very kind of tip of that whip whiplash today. All right, but we're looking at some other names as well that are uh, far larger businesses, certainly Meta and Alphabet. Yeah. Any worries there in terms of actual weakness in their underlying business? Look, I think we're, I think we're in an environment where you have to assume that everyone's going to feel uh, what's going on. And, and I think in this environment, what you have to do is um, those equities that you own, you have to think about a longer term perspective. Is, some, is this something that I'm willing to own through uh, a slower environment uh, to look through, you know, the improvement on the other side. Um, so, you know, my book, Snap, is one of those um, because of its strength with the youth kind of audience and its strength in technology and its relative kind of strength and kind of audience. Alphabet, in my mind, is another. Uh, but, you know, across the broad kind of internet ad landscape and the ad landscape generally, uh, you know, I've got many more neutrals and cells than I have stocks that I'd put money into today into this environment. Right. So in terms of places to hide within the space, are you arguing it's alphabet and snap pretty much? Yeah. I, and I wouldn't say that, that you're hiding. I would say that what you're doing is willing to look beyond. Um, you're willing to kind of, you know, marshal your resources into those stories that seem the strongest at this point. Um, and those in my book, uh, you know, make that cut. But that's not to say that the stocks are going to be immune to what's coming um, over the next, uh, you know, several days and weeks as we really kind of learn what the environment is pivoting to. Martin, appreciate that very much. Obviously, you can see the pain on the screen. And between that and new home sales, uh, Sarah, we do now have uh, the S&P below yesterday's intraday low. Martin, thanks. Great. Thank you. Carl, thank you very much. NASDAQ now down more than 3%. Continuing our coverage here from the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland, we have a company joining us that is really on the front lines of a lot of these issues being discussed in Davos, from geopolitics to supply chain. That is Micron Technology CEO Sanjay Marotra joins us now for an exclusive. It's, it's good to see you again. Great to be here, Sarah, with you. I, I, I want to start with the market, as, as Carl just referenced, which is down again. Tech stocks getting hit, your stock getting hit, and, and it's now... Lost about 30 percent since the, the January highs. Are the, are the fundamentals changing for you to, to warrant that kind of selling? So actually, if you look at long-term fundamentals, those are really strong. You know, there is increasing demand for memory and storage with AI, with 5G, autonomous. All these trends are healthy trends in the long term. Near term, certainly, you know, macroeconomic uncertainties, you know, uh, smartphone weakness, uh, given China, COVID lockdowns, as well as weaker China uh, consumer, as well as Ukraine, Russia, war impact. I think smartphone weakness is uh, somewhat well known uh, in terms of the smartphone unit sales expectations early part of the year versus smartphone unit sales expectations at this time. There is somewhat lowering in that regard uh, in the industry. Uh, and of course, on the PC side, on the consumer PC, uh, the Chromebooks and the low-end consumer PC, that weakness, I think, is well-known in the industry as well. Uh, however, 
the enterprise PC, commercial PC, the desktop PC, that is relatively healthy. And what's important is cloud demand is healthy. Automotive sector for us is strong. Industrial is strong as well. We have said that fiscal year 22 will be a record revenue, revenue year for Micron. So we are executing very well on our technology, on our manufacturing footprint, and I think we are long-term very well positioned for a new era of leadership. What about the U.S. in particular? And I, and I just wanted to mention it because we just got a pair of pretty ugly reports on Richmond Fed and, and housing data, and there are questions about whether we're going into recession and whether it might come sooner than Wall Street thinks. So there's no question that there are macroeconomic uncertainties, right? And we are certainly all, all businesses, all industries are navigating through this. I think what's important is that technology is what helps you power through the environment of global macroeconomic weaknesses. Memory and storage is becoming more and more critical to, again, all the end market drivers from data center to the intelligent edge to array of devices. So this all of these... I'm sorry to cut you off, but this reminds me exactly of what you said. How many years ago was it at Davos when you told me our industry is structural growth? It's not Which cyclical. Is, but everyone looks at semiconductors and think it's, thinks they're cyclical. Your stocks are behaving like they're cyclical. Our industry has secular demand drivers. Of course, industry will not escape macroeconomic trends, right? All industries get impacted by macroeconomic environments. And of course, industry will have cyclicality as well. But if you look at our industry, because memory and storage is becoming more valuable in terms of all end market applications, through the cycles, you see revenue growth, you see profitability in the industry strengthening. In Micron, you know, we are now leading the industry with our most advanced DRAM, with our most advanced NAND in production, well ahead of any other competitor. We have strengthened our profitability profile as well. So the macro macroeconomic trends you know, that the world is going through, we're not going to be escaping them, but the long-term trends are healthy. We had Investor Day just two weeks ago. We talked about that the memory and storage industry will go from about $160 billion in 2021 to $332 billion by 2030 timeframe. So think about it. It took the industry four decades mm. to get to $160 billion. It's going to be adding another $160 billion by the end of this decade. So there is that secular demand growth trend for memory and storage. How is the supply chain looking, especially now that there are factories being affected, including your own, in China? So we have, first of all, no wafer manufacturing in China. We have small assembly and test operation in China. And of course, our footprint is very well diversified with manufacturing in 11 different countries, 11 different sites uh, you know, across the globe. Uh, certainly, in terms of supply chain, as semiconductor shortages have hit everybody you know, across the board. Is it getting better? So I think overall supply chain is getting better for semiconductor availability, but it is not out of the woods yet. I expect it to continue to get better. Some of the shortages may still last into 2023, particularly on some of the foundry capacity as well as some of the analog legacy kind of nodes. Some of those may still last into 2023, but it is getting better. Semiconductor companies like Micron, we are investing in capital investments. For example, this fiscal year, we'll be at record levels of capital investments to continue to bring leading edge technologies into production. What about inflation in your industry, both, both on what you're feeling and what you're able to price on and what consumers are going to ultimately pay for electronics? Yeah. So certainly inflation is playing a role in terms of input costs going up, whether it's in construction of the fabs, materials used in building semiconductors, capacity, logistics, transportation, as well as labor and wages. So certainly inflation... And that's still is, rising? Uh, inflation is impacting, the, you know, uh, our company, as well as all industry. We are no exception in that regard. However, we continue to drive higher productivity, you know, through our manufacturing operations, through deploying smart manufacturing in our productions. In fact, Micron is recognized by many sources as a leader in semiconductor smart manufacturing in our industry. So we continue to drive for production and we continue to, of course, engage with our customers to make sure that we ha get the value that is deserved for our products because certainly profitability is key in terms of being able to reinvest in the business as well. So value for memory and products is going up and we continue to work with our customers in addressing the effects of inflation 
in, in terms of pricing it as well. President Biden making some news in Asia this week talking about Taiwan and the U.S. would defend it. Uh, there's, there's clearly a discussion about the next geopolitical risk here in Davos. What, what would happen to the semiconductor industry if China invaded Taiwan? So, I mean, Taiwan critically is hub of technology, hub of semiconductors for, you know, all global economies. So I think 